Healthcare officials are closely monitoring the new strain of coronavirus, and Dr. Malathi Srinivasan with Stanford Healthcare joins us now. And we know the new strain is more transmissible. Do we know why it's able to spread more easily? Yes, Michelle, you know, this new viral strain identified in uh, England in September, it's called B117, has mutations that appear to make it both more sticky and more abundant. And so, Michelle, what this means is the mutations are in the spike protein, which is the protein that sticks to the human receptor cells, and it binds to the ACE2 inhibitor a little bit more strongly. Um, and not only is it more sticky, but it's also more abundant. So that means that if you get it, you'll have seven to 10 times more copies in the upper airway than the original COVID strain that infected humans. So the bad news is, is that you can catch this virus much more easily from someone who's infected, or you can spread it more easily to someone if you have it. And that means that uh, much like in England and what we're seeing in Tokyo, it's going to be very easy to overwhelm the health system. But here's the good news. The people who are getting sick aren't getting more sick. So although it's more sticky, it doesn't make you sicker. And the second really important piece of good news here is that this mutation still appears to be sensitive to the Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccines that we have and the other vaccines. It's early days, um, but if you can get vaccinated, you should be uh, reasonably protected from this uh, viral strain. So do you think this new strain could eventually become the dominant strain? Michelle, I think so. And I think it's probably going to become the dominant strain by March or April of this year. Uh, we know that in England, because the B117 was so catchy, it became the dominant strain in just three months. And we know that the U.S. has not done a good job of containment. And we're seeing surges not only from Thanksgiving, but we're just starting to see the surges from the winter holidays. So I think between the surges and the fact that it's already here in the United States, um, we will, this will probably become the dominant strain in a couple of months. Uh, and the hope is that enough people will be vaccinated by then and that spread will be slowed down. So what does that mean for the U.S. then? Well, Michelle, it means that we have some big problems ahead. Um, like most viruses, this virus is growing fast and it mutates. And unlike Britain, where about 10% of all COVID uh, patients have their virus sequence, we don't have a national virus testing program. And this is important because with enough lead time, the pharmaceutical companies can create new mRNA vaccines in as little as six weeks. So of the 1.4 million people who are getting COVID virus tested uh, or who are getting COVID per week, Week, we're only sequencing about 3,000 of those uh, uh, viruses. So we actually don't know what strains are in the United States and how they're spreading. So we need a cogent national testing strategy, but we also need a cogent national sequencing strategy. Well, let's talk the vaccine now. Is there anyone who should not get the COVID-19 vaccine? There's only one group of people who should absolutely not get the vaccine, and that's people who had severe allergic reactions to the first dose of the two-dose regimen of the two vaccines that are currently FDA approved. And that's because this vaccine, the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, are safe for almost everybody, young, old, pregnant, healthy, chronic illnesses. There's only about 11 people in a million who are getting a severe allergic reaction. It's a very low number. And uh, we're observing people for those severe allergic reactions for about 15 minutes after vaccination. And that's because in the early studies of about almost 2 million people with the Pfizer vaccine, only 21 people had a severe allergic reaction. Most of those happened within about 13 minutes, uh, a couple up to a couple hours. And the people who were more likely uh, in that group of uh, 21 to have a, a reaction were people who'd had a severe anaphylactic reaction to something else before, but uh, it could have, you know, bee sting or antibiotic. But um, uh, all of those people had successful been discharged from the hospital or the emergency department after observation and treatment. And um, uh, these the, the complication rate is 0.2% for the vaccines. So uh, it's very safe for everyone, including for pregnant women. What, so let's talk more about women who are pregnant. Can they pass <laughs> on the virus to their newborn? Yeah, again, very good news for women uh, who are pregnant and expecting. Um, 
the there's a new study out of Boston that shows that 64 women who had COVID didn't have any COVID in their placenta or cord blood and their babies didn't have the COVID virus. So this is mainly extremely good news. The only uh, thing that sort of dims the uh, story a little bit is they also didn't pass on the antibodies that they had developed to their baby. So uh, if they got COVID, um, the baby was protected from getting COVID, um, but the baby didn't get the immunity that uh, they had achieved through being infected. Now, what we also know is that women who are pregnant, if they're hospitalized for COVID, do worse. Um, the rates of death are significantly increased. But the, uh, the mRNA virus doesn't incorporate into any of the uh, fetal tissue or human tissue at all. And so it's very, very safe to give to pregnant women, and it should be protective to help them fight off the infection. So the good news is, is, uh, is on two fronts. One, if you get sick, your baby will probably be okay if you don't get hospitalized. And the second is if you get the vaccine, you should be able to fight off the virus much more easily. So now that we know the virus spreads mostly through the air, is it still important to disinfect surfaces? Well, uh, Michelle, cleaning the air is much more important than cleaning surfaces. And we've known for a long time that this virus is fragile and that the viral particles were detectable on surfaces for so many days, from plastic countertops to all the grocery store bags. And I don't know about you, but it, in uh, using our retrospectoscope, it was probably a bit of overkill to be scrubbing down our potato chip and Dorito bags. But um, all those were early days, and we didn't know that most of the virus particles were uh, inactivated and dead. Uh, so I think that it's important to follow general good hand hygiene and general uh, good environmental hygiene. But cleaning the air um, and having good air circulation, having appropriate air filtration systems, and maybe even uh, for certain uh, commercial settings, UV filtration and UV light systems uh, are pretty important. What I would like to tell people is that it's important not to uh, go crazy and spray the air with germicides. Most germicides are toxic when we inhale it, uh, like bleach and hydrogen peroxide, and it's not sufficient to clean the air regularly and with the frequency that you need to stay safe. So first, um, it doesn't really help that much. And second, it can really harm. So if you're going to use a germicide in an area, please leave the area afterwards until it settles. Okay. Always good information. Dr. Malathi Srinivasan with Stanford Healthcare. Thank you. Thank you so much.